this video, we're going to talk about two concepts. We're going to talk about something called moment of inertia, and we're going to talk about torque. So we're going to be introducing these. So we said that back when we worked um, on the kinematic video that we have uh, we have uh, correct uh, correlations between uh, straight line motion or translational motion and rotational motion. So we have straight line velocity uh, versus uh, angular velocity and translational acceleration versus angular acceleration. We have displacement versus angular displacement. We have different symbols for all of those. So moment of inertia is the rotational equivalent of mass. Equivalent of mass. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why would we have an equivalent to mass? Isn't mass just mass? And to illustrate this, I want to go to a video. So I got to find that share screen. And go here. Nope. Where is it at? Uh, um, one second. I think, sorry about this. Need to go over here. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to run a simulation. I have um, five different objects. This is a solid sphere. This is a hollow sphere, like a ping pong ball. We have a disc, and then we have a solid, solid disc. Uh, or you call this a ring, and this would be a solid disc. And then over here, I have a block that has no friction. Um, we're going to deal with this in a different chapter. What I want to handle today is what's going to happen with these. So go ahead and make a prediction. Who's going to reach the end of the ramp first. Okay, if you need to pause the video, otherwise, let's run the simulation and see. So I'm gonna go ahead and run it, and then I'm gonna hit pause when we get close to the end. Okay, here we go. Was it what you thought it was going to be? So the winner is the solid sphere, second place is the solid cylinder, third place is the spherical, uh, the hollow sphere, and last place is the ring. Did you think maybe this was going to win because it was lighter? So what's going on with this? Well, these objects have different moments of inertia and it could actually be the same mass. They could have the exact same mass and they're still going to end up in different places. So what is moment of inertia? In rotational motion, we have to consider two things. We have to consider one, the mass, and two, we have to consider the mass distribution. Or how the mass is centered around the pivot point. And remember, we call that the center of mass. Center of mass. We represent moment of inertia with a um, italics I. So our symbol is the I. And the formula is we have a constant times the mass times the radius squared. So this is going to be the same. This part's the same for a sphere, for a hollow disk. So this is the same for all. But what we see is this constant varies depending on the object. So for a thin hoop or a ring, the constant is one. For a solid sphere, the constant is, mm -hmm, looking at my sheet here, uh, for the solid disk, the constant is 0.5. And for a, um, I don't know if I, a uh, uniform sphere. Oh yeah, uh, for a uh, solid sphere, the value is 0.4. So what does that mean? If I have a larger moment of inertia, so the takeaway here is that a larger moment of inertia is uh, more difficult to rotate. So the larger the moment of inertia, larger the moment of inertia, more difficult to rotate. Can you hear my light buzzing? It's been driving me crazy. 
And if you think about it, back when we talked about inertia, a straight line, we said if you were running through the woods and there was a moose chasing you, you should zigzag because it's going to be harder for the moose to change directions. He has more inertia. So, and the larger the moment of inertia, the more difficult it's going to be to rotate. So again, <clears throat> um, you don't have to memorize these uh, various formulas for the AP test. It'll give you a co coefficients if you need it, but you need, do need to know that the base here is mass times the radius squared. This also tells you that the radius has more of an effect on it than the mass does. Okay, so how does Newton's um, second law work when we're talking about something called torque? Uh, let's first talk about the symbol for torque. So the symbol for torque is the Greek letter tau. This is tau, and that represents torque. Um, and torque is defined as a force that causes rotation. A force that causes rotation. Now, for a uh, straight line motion, we always draw our free body diagrams as a box, and we assume that all the forces are acting on that center of the box. But for rotational motion, for torque, it, again, it matters where the force is being applied. So if I have a bar, I'm going to draw a bar here on a pivot point. So I'm going to make this the pivot. The circle's the pivot, and the red will be the bar. And let's say that I have um, a four meter bar and I'm going to apply my torque two meters away. So let's stop and think about this. Why do we open a door? Why is the handle here and not here? Have you ever tried to on a, a push bar door, open it from the middle versus the end? And you'll find that it's a lot more difficult to open it here than it is here. Well, it turns out that the formula for torque is called force times something called the lever arm. The lever arm is the point of the application, the distance between the pivot and the point of application of the force. So let's define that. Lever arm, <laughs> I'm gonna switch colors again. Let's go to purple. Lever arm is the distance between the application of the force and the pivot. Because if we're in rotational motion, it has to pivot, right? So if this whole thing is four meters, if I apply a 10 Newton force here and I apply a 10 Newton force here, we're not going to generate the same amount of torque. We're going to have different torques. So if torque, and by the way, this force is perpendicular. That's important. So we write this as force perpendicular. And I usually do lever arm. Old school, they do lever arm with a cursive. Um, a lot of times now you'll just see a D, but again, you know, I took physics a long time ago. So if we were going to multiply the, the torque here, we would have two times 10, we would have 20 Newton meters and that's the unit. But here I have 40 Newton meters. So pushing the door at this point gives us more torque um, versus pushing in the middle. And you'll see this on some applications, um, like it's called a torque wrench and it's got an, ex an extremely longer uh, handle or there's wrenches you can use and you put them on a regular wrench and it'll increase the length of the handle. The longer the lever arm, the greater the torque. So let's add that too. The longer the lever arm, the greater the torque. I think this video is kind of um, getting a little bit longer. So there's another point I need to make about torque in terms of what happens when we apply a force um, at an angle. So what if this was coming in at an angle like this, where we still have 10 Newtons? Um, and I have sample problems. So I think what we'll do is we'll talk about the application of uh, force applied at an angle and the sample problems uh, in the next video. Okay.
Uh, you know what though? How many sample problems do we have? Now I lied, we're gonna keep going. We've got a lot of sample problems on this. Okay, so what happens now if I take that same system and let me draw my arm again. I can do this rather quickly, I think. So I'm gonna go ahead with that two meter lever arm again. But this time I'm going to bring that, that um, 10 Newton force in at an angle of uh, 30 degrees. So this is going to be 30 degrees. Well, we define torque as the um, perpendicular force. So I would have, to, if I split this force out into vectors, we would see that only this portion right here, just this portion is my force perpendicular. This is parallel. This does not generate torque, this does. So how do I find this value? Well, we've learned, we've done enough trig that we know if we take the sine of 30, that's gonna be my vertical component over the hypotenuse, which is 10. And I'm going to have, um, uh, 10 sine of 30 as my force perpendicular. And then I'm gonna multiply that by my lever arm of two. And that's gonna give me my torque. And actually this ends up being um, uh, 10 sine of 30 times two ends up being 10. And this is gonna be kilogram meter squared over second squared, or it could be a uh, Newton meters so it actually is half. So when I apply this 30 degree, I drop my torque from 20 down to 10. Okay, so what are our takeaways here? Uh, rotational, a moment of inertia is the um, equivalent of mass. And it depends on this formula, this coefficient is going to vary. So we're going to see objects that have their mass further away from that center of mass, higher coefficients are gonna be harder to rotate. And then torque is an applied force that is perpendicular to the um, rotation uh, times the distance between the pivot and the lever arm. And we looked at some different applications of that. All right, in the second part of this, in a 904 part two, so this is 904 part one, we're going to do practice problems for torque. All right, we'll call it quits there.